Thank you very much for having us, uh, American Jewish Committee, Shari Tikva. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my name is Daniel Pincus. Um, I've been a member of AJC uh, since 2006. I currently serve as a board member of the National Board of Governors. And when I joined in 2006, I was asked what type of issues I wanted to get involved with. And I turned around the question. I said, what's not going well? And the response was Muslim Jewish relations. And so I said, okay, let me see what I can do. And sure enough, with some effort, I had come across uh, an individual uh, who came to the AGC Global Forum named Ilya Sikrovsky. And the year before, Ilya had started an organization himself called the Muslim Jewish Conference. Uh, MJC, as it's known, uh, puts on an annual week-long conference somewhere in Europe for about 100 to 150 young Muslim professionals from around the world. And two years later, in 2013, we had a conference in Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this gentleman showed up from Yemen. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to my dear friend, Mohamed al -Samawi. To tell you a little bit about me, um, I grew up in Yemen, in the capital city of Yemen, Sana'a. And I don't know if you noticed that, but I have a small disability. I have disability in the right side, in the right side of my body. I have disability in my hand and my leg. And when I was a kid, I was feeling jealous from other kids because they can play sport, they can play football, ride bicycle, and I couldn't do anything of that. But I have amazing parents who I, because I was very jealous from other kids. They can do everything that I can do. My parents taught me that I shouldn't be jealous. But instead of that, I should have a talent so other kids will be jealous from me. <laughs> and that's how I learned how to speak English. Wow. And when I grow up, I always had this feeling inside me that I want to be different. I want to show them that even if I have a disability, I can do something that they can do. When I was 23 years old, I met a Christian teacher in Yemen. He's from England and he, he used to live in Sana'a. And me and him, we became friends. We became friends, but I had one thing against him. He wasn't a Muslim. And I thought to myself that he's a perfect man, but I need to give him a gift. And my gift is, I will convert him to be a Muslim. <laughs> so I came to him and I told him, if you care about our friendship, I want you to read the Quran and I give him the holy book of Muslims. And he told me, okay, but in one condition. And he gave me the Bible. <laughs> and he told me the same time I'm reading the Quran, I want you to read the Bible. This was a unique thing for me. I went back home and I was thinking that I'm reading the Christian Bible. So I start from the beginning, from the first page. And he didn't tell me that the Bible has Old Testament, New Testament. He didn't tell me that. If I start actually reading from the beginning, I'm actually reading the Jewish Bible. So from the first page, I wasn't really trying to read the book. I was trying to find the aha. I was trying to find the thing that I can say, my book is much better than this book. Uh -huh. So from the first page, I start searching for questions I can ask him. I called him and I said, look, I have this question for you. And I started asking him. He said, no, no, Muhammad, go to the middle of the book. I said, why? He said, because I want you to read the New Testament. You're reading now the Old Testament. I said, why? So he said to me, this is the Jewish Bible. And he told me that that old feeling that I told you about, that I want to be unique, came to me again. I'll read the book of the people who hate us, the people who want to kill us, the Jews. And I thought to myself that, you know, when I read the book, maybe I will understand why Jews hate Muslims. So I started reading the Torah, and I found an amazing book. There is a lot of similarities, actually, between the Bible and the Quran. Actually, there is a lot of phrases. If you translate it to Arabic, it will be the same thing as Quran. But I couldn't find the answer that I was searching for, which is why Jews hate us if they have such amazing book. So I decided that I need to find a Jew and ask him, why do you hate us? <laughs> uh, in Yemen, I couldn't find a Jew. <laughs> 
So I decided that I need to find, I need to ask a Jew. So I discovered something called Facebook. And I thought that through Facebook, I can find Jews and ask them. Um, and you need to excuse me, I didn't know how to use Facebook at that time. So I started adding hot girls from Israel as friends. <laughs> And you can imagine, actually, that nobody except, except my request. Um, and then I realized that this is not the way how you use Facebook. So I started sending private messages. And my message was a typical message that I send it to everyone. It was saying like this. Greetings, greetings from Yemen. My name is Mohammed. I know that you're Jew. I know that you live in Israel. What do you think about Yemenis? What do you think about Muslims? You're sincerely Mohammed. You can imagine with such a message, you know, a lot of them, they didn't respond. It's like a Nigerian prince asking you for a million dollars or something like that. Um, and some of them, they responded by, in a way of hi and bye. It's like, we don't hate you, now move on. And others was very interested that someone from Yemen is asking such questions. One of them, his name Nimrud. At that time, he was living in Tel Aviv. And me and him, we began having discussion on Facebook. And he told me, we don't hate you. You know, actually, there is a lot of Jews and Muslims live, live together in peace. I said, no, but Jews, they hate us. They want to kill us. He said, let me show you. So he started to introduce me to Jews and Muslims on Facebook in a page called Yalla Young Leaders. It's a page on Facebook between uh, activists from, Syria, uh, from Israel and Palestine. Together, they speak about peace. And I also find activists from Sudan, from Egypt, from all over the world in that page. And I always was angry from God because he gave me such disability. But then I realized that maybe God gave me such a disability for a purpose in my life. And maybe this is my purpose of my life. You see, because of my disability, I learned how to speak English. And because I learned how to speak English, I had the chance to read the Torah and the Bible. So maybe that's my chance in life. That's my purpose of life. So I start posting on Facebook about the similarities between Quran, Torah, and the Bible. And I became activist online more and more with it. Unfortunately, there was a war in Gaza. And because of the war in Gaza, everyone on the Facebook group started to be sensitive. The Jews started to be sensitive. The Arabs started to be sensitive. And one of the Arabs, he sent me a message. He told me, Muhammad, don't believe they are nice. He means Jews. They're only nice because you are online. If you meet them face to face, you'll see how much they are mean. I believe them because I never met a Jew. And all of them are very nice with me on Facebook. So I decided that I need to see a Jew. <laughs> but how to do that? It was hard for, for me in Sana'a to find a Jew. So I googled. I, I went to Google and I said, I am Muslim. I want to meet a Jew. So maybe there is something called Muslim Jewish Conference. For some reason, there is actually something that was calling Muslim Jewish Conference. And that year, it was in Bosnia. So I applied for the conference. And they accepted my application. And I was very happy. I thought that they were paying for my visa, they were paying for my ticket. And they told me, no, you need to pay for your visa and you need to pay for your ticket if you want to come to the conference. The problem is I'm from Yemen. I can't travel to Bosnia without a visa and we don't have a Bosnian embassy in Yemen. So I have to go to a third country to apply and then to go to Bosnia. It's a lot of money and I was thinking inside me, does it worth to lose all this money to see a Jew in my life? <laughs> Or should I just forget about everything that I learned and I just stay at home? I decided to do it. So I traveled. I went to Turkey and then from Turkey I went to Bosnia. And I was among uh, Muslims and Jews. Actually, the first Jew I met, he wasn't only a Jew. He was a Jew, Israeli, and gay. It's like three in one for me. <laughs> and in Bosnia, you know, I met all these wonderful people and one of them Daniel, who I spoke with him barely like for five minutes. And that's it. I went back to Yemen and I started having this kind of purpose of my life. I want to tell my family and my friends about what I saw in Bosnia. I, I, I want to do peace building activities. Unfortunately, um, people, a, lot, a lot of people, they didn't like what I was doing. So one, of, one, one time I decided to do a Skype call between Jews and Muslims, Jews and Yemenis. And it didn't went well. Because of the Skype call, uh, some friends of mine accused me for being agent for Mossad. Such accusation in Yemen, it can end your life, basically. You can't have any relationship with a Jew, with an Israeli. How about the Mossad? 
anyone who wants to end your life, they can do it like this. So I, um, so I, um, I received threats. I started receiving threats on Facebook. People with Osama Bin Laden picture tell me that you know we will kill you and all these things. And I never made it real. I never thought that it's something real because it's an on Facebook. And I'm this person who's like threatened me, he only have two friends or three, three friends. It seems from me that they just create this account to make, to make me scared. But then anyway, of course, I was afraid kind of. And I don't know if you heard what's happening in Yemen, but in 2014, 2015, there is a group called Houthis. And they have this disgusting logo which says, death to America, death to Israel, damn the Jews. And they came to the capital city of Yemen. When they came to the capital city of Yemen, there was no police anymore. There was no army anymore. There's no one can protect you from them. Actually, even the president himself was a hostage in his house. He can't leave his house. And I didn't know what to do. I was thinking that, you know, maybe I will be safe as other Yemenis safe who lives in, still in Yemen. I received threats. And threats was personal to me because of my activities. And I had to leave. I had to do something. So the president of Yemen escaped from his home and he went to Aden, which is another city in Yemen. It's in the south of Yemen. And he gave announcement. He said Aden now will be the safe capital city for Yemen. He invited the government, he invited the police and everyone to go there. And I believed him. I believed him that if I will go to Aden, I will be safe. If I will go to Aden, I will have police. I went to Aden and I discovered that it was a lie. There is no police, there is no government, there is an extreme Salafi groups save him and protect him. You see, in Yemen we never had a problem between Shia or Sunnah. We always we are living in peace. When you go to mosque, there's no different about mosques if you are Shia or Sunnah, you just pray. Um, but unfortunately, things became much worse because of the Houthis and people start to use uh, sectarian fights against each other. So Aden, the city where I, I tried to escape to, is mostly Sunnah. But I thought that I would be safe. I went there, I, I was in the city, I saw all these armed people in the city. I was thinking that maybe it's better for me to go back to Sana'a. Maybe it's much better for me to go back to where my family live. Unfortunately, it was late. Because Houthis, they came all the way from the north to the south. And then the civil war started. Civil war between two extreme groups, and I was in the middle of that. At that time, I was working with an organization called Oxfam. I called my organization Oxfam. I asked them, can you please help me out? They gave me the bad news. All the international stuff had been evacuated already. Saudi Arabia started doing bombing airstrikes in Yemen. And because of the airstrikes that Saudi Arabia was doing in Yemen, a lot of extreme groups start to be everywhere. You, I couldn't leave even my house. I couldn't leave my apartment where I, where I was staying. And I was trying to say, what should I do? I called friends, I called family, I called everyone that I know. Can you please help me out? And nobody was able to help me out. The more dangerous thing, extreme groups like Al-Qaeda and other Salafist groups, they gave announcement. They said, anyone from the north, like me, like from Sana'a, anyone who's Shia, my background is Shia, but we never had problem before, will be killed in the next 24 hours. And I didn't know what to do. You know, they can't recognize me from three things. From my accent, because we have different accent between the people in the north and the south, because my skin color, we have different skin color, and because my last name, my family name, my family, like if they take my ID, they will see that, you know, my last name is Shia, it's a Shia family. So I was thinking, what should I do? I don't have, I don't have even enough food that I can survive a lot. And I was thinking that maybe it's better for me to kill myself. Because if Al-Qaeda or these extreme groups will catch me, they will not just kill me, they will torture me first and then they kill me. And I can see all these horrible pictures on Facebook. I decided to do one last thing. I decided to use Facebook. I decided to use Facebook asking everyone to help me out. And everyone started trying to help me out. Some, some of them, they couldn't help me. Some of them, they would tell me, we will pray for you. And some of them was very motivated, like Megan, 
who at that time was living in Tel Aviv. And she, like she knows me because we were doing a lot of peace activities, me and her. And she wanted to help me out, so she sent an email to all her friends asking them, do you know anyone in Yemen who can help my friend in Yemen? She sent an email to someone his name Justin. She didn't know that actually I know Justin. So when Justin received the email, he wrote her back. He said, Megan, I know someone in Yemen who is a peace activist. I think he will be able to help your friend. <laughs> he gave her my contact information. And he, she told him, I'm actually speaking about Mohammed. Another woman is Natasha, who lives in Tel Aviv. I met her also in a conference in Jordan. She told me, I want to help. The three of them, with Daniel, was trying to help me out. So I was at a Jewish wedding in Brooklyn on a sunny Sunday afternoon in late March of 2015. <clears throat> and it was a wedding of an old college friend. I didn't know that many people there. And um, so I checked my Facebook. I looked at, you know, looked at my phone, saw what was going on on Facebook, and there was a very long message from a guy who I had met a year and a half before at a conference. He was really nothing more than that. He was a guy who, had, you know, who I had met, said hello to a couple of times, and, and we became friends with him. He my contact information. And he sent me a request saying that he's in a desperate situation, he was describing to me all these details about what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in, in Aden, the city where he had moved to, um, the deteriorating uh, state of uh, the security, what's going on with Al-Qaeda, his personal activities that led to the threats. And I didn't really know much what to do. But I decided that my family had escaped the Holocaust on my father's side, my, grand, my uh, maternal grandparents or great-grandparents had, had escaped the Russian Empire, the pogroms there in, at the turn of the century. And so I decided that it was part of my responsibility to act. Two generations before, he was in a similar situation to what my ancestors were in. And because people who made the decision to help, uh, people whose names I don't know, I can't thank them, uh, but I'm sure that there were people along the way who did the right thing uh, and helped them survive, and that's what allowed me to live. So I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I looked up on, uh, <laughs> I said, where, where can I fly him? There's an airport in Aden, uh, where can I fly him? So I didn't even know what airlines are flying in and out of, of Aden. So I went on kayak.com, <laughs> it's good for something. And I said, okay, find the airport code for Aden, what cities, you know, maybe you can go to Cairo, maybe you can go to Oman. And finally I found that there was an Egypt Air flight from Aden to Cairo, $500, same day, one-way flight, good, let's do it, that's my responsibility, I'll do this. And so I got his personal information, put in my, my credit card information, I was gonna buy him the ticket, and I was, uh, as I was about to hit purchase, I saw that the screen went some, some like error message, that you can't purchase this ticket, I'd never been on the Egypt Air website in my life. And, and I realized, that as I looked it up, I said, I discovered that the Saudis had declared Yemen a no-fly zone. Wow. And all international commercial airline traffic in and out of Yemen was canceled that day. Wow. So I said, okay, now what? What can we do? So it occurred to me that I had a friend who served in the U.S. Army. Uh, he served in Afghanistan. And he was one of the first teams uh, that dealt with the Taliban, teamed up with Hamid Karzai. So I gave him a call. I said, look. You've dealt with, uh, you dealt with the Taliban in Afghanistan. I have a friend who's surrounded by Al-Qaeda in Yemen. He's asking me personal security questions. I'm not quite sure how to advise him. Can you get on, the phone, can you get on Skype with him and uh, see what, you know, how he can help you? And so he said, look, I'm in the middle of I'm, I'm active duty. I can't really help your friend right now, but I have a friend who's retired. He'll give you a call the next hour. So I was at my office in Livingston, New Jersey. And in 15 minutes, the most intense man I've ever spoken to in my life gets on the phone. <laughs> and he starts asking me these very pointed questions. What's your friend's name? What's his last name? Is he a Sunni? Is he a Shia? Is he a Zaidi Shia? With, what's his skin color? Where has he spent his life? What's his accent like? Does he have a beard? Does he have a long beard? Does he have a mustache? Where in Aden is he? Is he below the airport? Does he have a computer? Does he have a cell phone? Is there electricity? Is there a cell phone service? How much food? How much water does he have? I didn't even know the answers to these questions. And very quickly, he, very quickly he says, uh, okay, look, I can have a plane on the ground in Naden for tw in 24 hours for $50,000. <laughs> I 
And I didn't, I didn't, that was not even the question that I asked him. I, did, I didn't ask him. <laughs> so all of a sudden, this very fast-paced conversation comes to a screeching halt. And he said, what are you thinking about? I said, I don't even know how to think about this. Like, I, you know, what he was asking me to do is wire $50,000 to, to Kenya to hire an airline outfit out of Nairobi that was going to fly into a country that doesn't exist, into an, enter the airspace and land at an airport that's under siege, mm -hmm. and go pick up a guy who's 10 kilometers from the airport, doesn't have a car, and is surrounded by Al-Qaeda. So I didn't even, like, I need a lawyer. Yeah. Is this even legal, right? Okay. So he said, look, maybe you don't understand the situation your friend's in, but I do, and maybe, you, maybe, you, uh, maybe you've never dealt with a situation like this before, but I have. So maybe, l let me explain it to you, and maybe that'll help you make a decision. So the country collapsed. The president has fled the country. The, uh, the United States has pulled out all of its counterterrorism and consular staff. There's a civil war that's breaking out. It's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets any better. You could probably guess that Yemen is today where Syria was five years ago. Yeah. The airport in the north in Sana'a was bombed. It'll take them two weeks to rebuild the runway if they start now and they're not starting anytime soon. The airport in the south where he is in Aden is intact, but there's no air traffic control. The Saudis are in the process of setting up no-fly zone. They've declared it, but it's probably not in force yet, so you could probably force a plane in there without it getting shot down. Your friend is alive. He's in a secure location. It means he's, he's hiding in his apartment. He's not running in the streets. He's not hiding in a field. He's not held hostage yet. He has about five days worth of food and water, and he probably can't get any more. He has about $500 in US currency and about 100 more in local currency, but he probably can't get any more, any more of that either. He has electricity, a cell phone, cell phone, a, uh, cell phone service, a computer, and a landline phone, but, all, but the electricity and the, cell, the phone service is probably going to get taken out soon. You have a live offer to go get him, and you have a very fast-changing situation, and if any one of these parameters changes, you probably lost the opportunity to save him. What do you do? I still didn't know the answer. There was silence on the phone. He said, look, you never know if and when you're going to find yourself in the situation. Well, actually, what he said was, he said, this is your friend, right? <laughs> I didn't exactly want to get into this, the nature of the discussion, the, 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 relation, the nature of our relationship, which is that I met this guy a year and a half ago at a conference, and that was about it. He said, look, you never know if and when you're going to find yourself in this situation. But if you ever did, you'd be really glad to know that there was someone on the other side with the ability and the will to do what it takes to get you out. <laughs> and that reminded me of my ancestors who thankfully were among the people who got out and who were able to live to tell the story. So I said, look, if this isn't what $50,000 is for, I don't know what it's for. Mm -hmm. So I called him up. I said, Muhammad, can you get to the airport? And he said, Dan, they're bombing the airport as we speak, and there's no way I can get to the airport. Like, no part of this plan is going to work. So I called back the Army guy, and he said, uh, I said, Muhammad doesn't think he can get to the airport, and he doesn't think he can land a plane there either. He said, look, the Kenyans changed their mind. The Saudis have enough flies, and they're not willing to fly in any way. So when he said you have a fast-changing situation, that's what, that's what he meant. So I, these are the sort of who am I and what am I questions. Like, am I the guy who, when presented an opportunity to save a guy's life who you barely know uh, for even $50,000, do you say yes or do you think about it? I wasn't quite sure I was comfortable with the fact that I was a guy who thinks about it instead of instinctively coming to the answer yes. But now I was that guy. I said yes. Great. But the army guy said, I'll call you back in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes later, he's, he calls me up and he says, I found a Greek fishing company that has a boat in the port of Aden. They need to get it out. Send me your friend's exact location. When they're ready to go, they'll pick him up. I said, Mohammed, where are you? He said, I don't know. I'm new in town, and there are no street names or addresses here. Just like building, you know, you gave directions based on landmarks. So I said, you have an Android phone. Open up Google Maps. Zoom all the way in. Switch a satellite view. Drop a pin. Take a screenshot. Zoom out. Screenshot. Zoom out. Screenshot. Send me the files. That's where you are. <laughs> I mean, people in civilians in, in war zones in Yemen now have access to geolocation and satellite imagery. This is the reality that we're living in. So we sent it to the Greeks, and now is a waiting game. A day and a half later, the guy calls me up. He says, I have good news and bad news. The good news is the Greeks are ready to go. The bad news is they want $700,000. <laughs> and the issue was that the, the Saudis had a naval blockade, and they were allowing international boats and people to leave, but not Yemenis. So the Greeks knew that they were taking a risk by taking this Yemeni out, and they also that they were dealing with a, a, a US military guy. Clearly, there's some wealthy Americans who love the guy. Let's see how much they love him. So they were testing the market. Anyway, Mohammed said, There's, I don't even have $700, and, and even if you give them half up front, they're just going to throw me overboard and avoid the risk of running the, the naval blockade with the Yemeni. So that plan fell, fell through. So Jeff said, the, the, the guy said, I'll call you back in five minutes. 
Five minutes later, it turned out it was a day, he says, I found a helicopter out of Djibouti that can get him out for $80,000. And at some point, you're playing the game of what's the price? What is the price of this guy's life, right? If, if I was willing to do it instinctively for $500, and I finally came to the decision that for $50,000, all right, the guy's life is worth $50,000 to me. And $700,000 felt like it was a bit too much, even though that's absurd. $80,000 is like, all right, let's just go. I'm not gonna make the mistake of waiting too long. So I called up Mohammed and I said, can you get to the roof of your building? He said, no, but why? I said, if you can't get up by car, because you'd have to go right into the fighting and Al Qaeda has all these checkpoints. You can't get up by boat because there's a, there's a naval blockade. You can't get up by plane because the, the, at this point, the airport was pretty much bombed. Either the war is just magically going to stop, or you're magically going to survive the war, or you're getting out on a helicopter. And he said, Dan, there's no way you can fly a helicopter in here. It's going to get shot down by just about everybody, whether it's the, the Saudis, the Houthis, Al Qaeda, some kid with an RPG. <coughs> and he said, I'd rather take my chances and hide in the bathroom than die for certain on a helicopter. So I said, all right, that's, that's your choice. So, yeah, as I, as I told you, like, you know, with, with Daniel, there is three others that he doesn't also know was trying to help me out. Megan, who at that time was living in Tel Aviv, she reached a friend of her who works at the United Nations in New York. And she asked her friend, can you please help my friend in his situation? And her friend told her a secret. She told her, listen, if Mohammed can go to Sheraton Hotel in Aden, he will be safe. Because in Sheraton Hotel, we have food, we have security, and we have electricity. And Saudi Arabia knows that we are hiding the UN there so they will not bomb the hotel. He just need to go there. So Megan called me and she said, you need to go to the hotel right now. And I told her, but how? There is no taxis anymore. There is no cars in the streets. There is only fighters. And if I go out from my building, there is just a checkpoint near my building. And they will catch me. She said, I don't care. You need to do something right now. So I called Oxfam, my organization. And I told, her, I told them, I just want one thing from you. Can you please send a driver to drive me from my apartment to the hotel? And that's it. I don't need anything from you. They told me, OK, we will try our best. At that time, my phone died. And there is no electricity. So I didn't know whether they will send the car or not. I was looking through the window, and I can see the checkpoint. And after 30 minutes, I saw a car, 4x4, four four, waiting near my building. And I thought to myself, that's Oxfam. And if, they, if I don't go right now, they will just leave because they can't reach me on the phone. So I made the choice that I need to go downstairs. I went downstairs. I was trying to act very cool. I was that close to that, to that car. And someone shouted. He said, you, stop. It was one of the fighters. And he, when he told me stop, I started shaking. And he came to me and he said, what's your name? I told him, my name is Muhammad Ali. <laughs> It's funny here, but in Yemen, a lot of people have the same name. Um, and it's true. It's like my father's name is Ali, and I told him my name is Muhammad Ali. I didn't want to tell him my last name is Al Samawi, because if I told him my last name, he would just kill me. And he told me, are you Houthi? Are you from the north? I said, no. He said, give me your ID. And remember, like, if I gave him my ID, he would just kill me. And I couldn't think clearly. I told him my ID is upstairs in the building. He said, OK, go upstairs. We will come with you, and we will take the, the ID. And I started shaking, and I said, that's the end. Like, no, they will kill me inside my apartment. I went upstairs, and I started opening the door. And they asked me the most stupid question, which has actually saved my life. They told me, is there a woman inside? You see, in Al-Qaeda ideology, in extreme ideology, they don't go to houses that there is a woman, a strange woman. You need to keep the woman away from them in a room or something like that so they can enter. So I told them, yes. They said, OK, go inside, and we're waiting for you here. Give us your ID. I went inside, and the last thing I wanted is to hear my mom. I want to say to my mom goodbye. I was always bad son to my mom. I blamed my mom for my disability. I blamed my mom when people accused me for being agent from Mossad, for everything bad happened in my life. And the last thing I want to hear her voice. So remember that my phone was dead, but there is a landline. So I went to the landline. I know my home number. I called my home number, and I started hearing my mom crying, and I'm crying. And I, at the any moment, I was thinking they will come right now, and they will shoot me from the back. And I started hearing, Allah Akbar, people were shouting, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, and I hear boom, boom, and gun shooting. And I said, I don't know what's happening here. I need to see what's happening. I went to the stairs, and all the people that were waiting for me, they're not there. 
I went to the window and I saw the most horrible thing in my life. They caught someone else from the north and they started beating him in the street. But this is not the worst thing that I saw. The worst thing I saw is that civilians like me, like you, they came downstairs watching. And nobody told them, like, don't kill this human being, he's just human being. It's a um, disgusting thing about war. When, when there is a war, everyone just acting unnatural. But when they were watching Al-Qaeda and the extreme groups beating that man, it gave me the chance because they made a circle around them and the car is still waiting there. So I said to myself, that's it, I am the next one. If I'm not moving, they will just kill me and the car is still waiting. So I went to the car, I opened the door, I closed the door and I told him, go, go, go. And he looked at me, he said, well, who are you? I said, Oxfam. He said, what's Oxfam? <laughs> He's not from Oxfam. I closed my eyes, I opened my eyes, and I saw this man with a big beard. Usually with someone with a big beard means that he's religious or someone who can support Al-Qaeda. And I started crying and I started telling him, like, you know, listen, I'm not Houthi, please don't kill me. I started showing him my disability. This man really is the true message of Islam. Because when he saw me, he said to me, I don't want to kill you, I want to help you. Where do you want to go? And he risked his life, literally. He told me, hide in the car, and he started driving me in his car, like I was in the back seat, and he was driving me all the way to the hotel. There was like almost 20 checkpoints between the, my apartment and the hotel, and in all the checkpoints, nobody stopped him, because nobody is thinking like someone like him with a big beard is hiding someone like me in his car. He risked his life, and I owe him a lot of things for that. And I arrived to, uh, arrived to the hotel. The good thing, because of Megan, the UN knows that I will be there, so they gave me a nice room with a nice view <laughs> to the sea. And I had electricity again. I was able to reach Daniel and the others. The bad news that the UN decided that they would do evacuation for their own stuff. But they said that you know, they will not take me out with them. Ask them if they can take me. They said, we will see. The next day I wake up, I found myself alone in Sheraton Hotel with the hotel stuff. I've got one. Um, so there's a bit of an odd story here, which is that I had a, uh, a very young, self-taught jazz pianist in my apartment named Joey Alexander. <clears throat> and when he was 10 years old, Joey came to the United States, um, and he was in my apartment. And I, uh, when I received that message from Muhammad, uh, I asked Joey, I said, Joey, I have a friend in a really bad situation. He's in a war zone. He's all by himself. He's very scared, and he's probably going to die very soon. Would you play for him the last piece of music he'll ever hear in his life? And Joey, at 10 years old, uh, played uh, Over the Rainbow for him in the most extraordinary rendition you can imagine. And I sent it to Muhammad. He'd never heard the song before. Um, and he said, I'm, uh, I said, did you get the file? He said, yes. And he said, I'm crying. I don't know if that's the right reaction. And I said, don't worry, I'm crying too. But I, what I told him, I said, what you need right now is a friend. You need, you need to, you, you can use this piece of music to, to make a friend on the ground. And through, in part through the song, Muhammad uh, shared it with some of the staff at the hotel who uh, later helped him out. What, what we wound up doing, and it was part, in part uh, Justin, and we, we'd been scouring everything. Justin and Megan uh, discovered that there was a, uh, a way that possibly um, we could petition other countries who might be doing evacuations with their citizens out of Yemen to include him. Notably, the United States did not ev evacuate our own citizens. Uh, we'd been, the State Department had war been warning American citizens <laughs> for years not to go, for months to get out if they were already there. So by the time the war had broken out, it was, it was too late and the United States was not doing anything. So it became a very strange petition for a bunch of Americans to be petitioning a third country, not to ev evacuate Americans, but to evacuate a Yemeni out of, of Yemen. And the likelihood of these evacuations actually happening is, is quite slim because these evacuations are very dangerous. And the other issue is that Yemen is the size of Texas. And here we have a guy who doesn't have much mobility. So it's irrelevant if the evacuation is taking place even a few miles away. He couldn't even get there if, uh, even if, it, if we had permission. So finally, we found that there was a country, uh, it turns out to be India, uh, that was doing an evacuation that, that we'd heard over public channels, the media. Uh, that they were planning to do an evacuation of their citizens. And so we called them up and we said, look, can we, can, would you consider uh, including uh, Mohammed al-Samawi, a peace activist on behalf of 
uh, Muslim-Jewish relations, and for that he's been specifically targeted for his activities, uh, would you consider including him in your evacuation? And they said no, but the reason why no is we have thousands of people in the country. The boat that's going to be coming is going to be taking hundreds. We can't evacuate a Yemeni citizen before we've gotten all of our own people out first. And so we said, look, all that we're asking is if at the time that your boat's leaving, you've gotten all of your own people out in the area, there's, there's still room on your boat, and our guy's right there at the port, would you at least even consider putting him on the boat? And they said maybe. And we said, okay, well, maybe he's not no, just you need to tell us when and where uh, it's going to happen. And so with that, and, and we, we brokered the relationship with India through a couple of different channels, including AJC, which was absolutely instrumental, as well as uh, through a U.S. senator from Illinois named Mark Kirk, uh, who when he was a U.S. congressman from Illinois, Justin Hefter worked in, uh, worked in his office. And Megan Hallahan, through her, through her professional contacts at the Yala Young Leaders, had a relationship with the U.S. State Department. And Natasha Westheimer was an intern at the State Department. So together, this team had put together a diplomatic, uh, an outreach, uh, very ad hoc uh, project to petition India to include, uh, include Mohammed in their evacuation. And the first night of Passover, it, this, whole, this whole initiative took about 48 hours. And on, by Friday afternoon, the second week of this project of trying to get Muhammad out, uh, we heard that India had tentatively agreed to do this, and we were just waiting for the evacuation to happen. And Friday night was the first night of Passover. So um, I was in the hotel room, and then Justin, he called me. He said, Muhammad, I want you to go to the board right now. I said, why? He said, the evacuation started, and you need to go to the board. So with the help of the hotel staff, I was in the board. And I saw a lot of Indians, like 400 Indians, waiting to be evacuated. And like 100 Yemeni also was trying to be evacuated. But the bad thing is that the military Indian ship was not in the board. It was in the middle of the sea. And the only way to go there is by fishing boats. So there was fishermen, fishing boats. That's the only way how you can go there. I went there. I told them, I'm, I have my name in the, in the list. They said, no, your name in the list, it's not in the list. We only take Indians. So I thought that this is the end, like, you know, I won't, and I will not be evacuated. And at that time, story of my life, my phone was almost dying. <laughs> so I was almost, like, um, not reaching anymore any one of them. And one of the fishermen, he saw me that, you know, I was just, like, tired from my phone. He came to me, he said, do you want a phone? I said, yes. He said, give me your watch. So he took my watch and he gave me, do you remember these old Nokia phones? Mm -hmm. So he gave me one of them. And I, don't, I forget how even to use it. I was sending messages to Daniel and Justin and others with all these grammatical mistakes, and I didn't care. <laughs> and I, asked, I, I told him, like, this is my new number. You need to help me out. And when I was in the board, I heard one of the Indians was speaking on the phone. He says, Captain, Captain, we are still in the ship. I went to the Indian man. I told him, are you speaking with the Indian captain of the ship? He said, yes. I said, can you please give me the phone? And he gave me the phone. So uh, at the time, we thought that the evacuation had concluded and that Mohammed was not part of it. Um, and we, while Mohammed's phone had died, we weren't quite sure what had happened. We weren't sure if, if he was killed. If we, we had no idea. It was just radio silence. But we did have the phone number of the captain of the ship. And so Justin, who at the time we'd sort of divided up responsibilities, I was in charge of a relationship with the, the Indian embassy in DC. Justin, as it turns out, was in discussions with the, the Indian embassy in Yemen. And so I told Justin, I said, Justin, this is the most important call of your life. You've somehow got to convince an Indian Navy, Navy captain to remain in a war zone, send back a, the, the fishing boat to pick, to pick up a guy that it seems he's not supposed to be picking up. Go. So Justin gets on the phone and he said, Captain, with this wonderful Northern California accent, Captain, this is Justin. I'm calling from the United States. We, we requested your country to evacuate a Yemeni citizen named Muhammad al Samawi. He's at the port. Please send back the fishing boat. And the captain says, OK, click. <laughs> We're all like, you know, on Skype. Again, I've never met these people in my life. I've never, Justin's on, in San Francisco. I'm sitting in my apartment in my underwear in New York. It's like a Saturday morning. And, and he said, uh, I said, we're like, Justin, what did you say? He said, okay. We're like, what does that even mean? Would, okay, does it, did he understand the request? Was, is he just hanging up on you to get rid of you? So, so sure enough, the boats. So, yeah, uh, the boats came back again. 
And then they said, all the Yemenis come, all the Yemenis come. And all the Yemenis was really excited that, you know, they changed their minds and they said, we can leave now. So we made it, we were in the fishing boats and we were in the middle of going to, the big, to this big military operation. And when we arrived to this big military Indian ship, there were spotlights and someone in the microphone was saying, Mr. Mohammed is Samawi, Mr. Mohammed is Samawi. And all the Yemenis said, who's he, who's he? Like they're searching for me, I said, it's me. I was, I was evacuated with all the Yemenis and I was in, in the big military ship. And India was an amazing country because when we were in the, in the military ship, they started playing Indian music because they don't want us to hear the bombs and the airstrikes and, and the gun shooting. And they gave food to everyone like in, in the ship, including the Yemenis. And it was the second day of Passover and I was looking to the stars and um, for the first time, for a long time in my life, I feel like the stars are so beautiful and I feel like you know, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. So um, India evacuated all of us to Djibouti, to Africa. So I actually crossed the Red Sea in Passover <laughs> from Yemen to, uh, to Djibouti. It's like the wrong direction in some way. But I was in Djibouti and Daniel, um, he posted on Facebook. He said, does anyone know anyone in, um, in Djibouti? So the issue was that uh, the Syrian refugee crisis has been trying the world's uh, ability to absorb refugees, and, and Yemen is an even slightly larger, uh, pop more populous country than, than Syria, and was about to become another net producer of, of refugees. And Djibouti, being the nearest country by sea to Yemen, was not really prepared or interested in receiving so many, and was not really willing to issue visas, tourist visas or, or otherwise, to Yemenis and trying to enter Djibouti. So this is one of the big hurdles. How do we, we got him out of, we got him out of Yemen, but where is he gonna, where is he gonna go into? And so I wrote on my Facebook page, does anyone know anyone in Djibouti? Sure enough, the former director of the European Union of Jewish Students, who I'd met at the AGC Global Forum, called me up and she said, uh, when I was living in Paris, I knew a guy from Sierra Leone and I think he has a friend in Djibouti. <laughs> I said, all right, well, that's all I've got to work with, make the call. So there I was at the Museum of Modern Art, and this guy calls me up. He said, Deborah said you need a favor, what can I do? I said, look, I don't know you, but I've got a friend, and he's on a boat to Djibouti, and he needs a visa. And he said, send me a copy of this passport, the name of the boat, the day and time of arrival, I'll take care of it. It was the shortest conversation I've ever had in my life, making the weirdest request I've ever made. And this man came to the police station, and actually, all, like, when we arrived, we were the first Yemenis ever to arrive because of the war in, in Yemen. So the Djiboutians, they didn't know what, how to deal with us, so they put us all in a police station in a jail. And after like, Daniel posted on Facebook, this man came to the police station and he says, where is Mr. Mohammed Samawi? And again, all the Yemenis, who are you, man? <laughs> so I was out of the jail and they gave me a visa for 10 days. And then I didn't know what to do. Like, you know, I was thinking, like, you know, what, should do I, what should I do right now? And I was having like all these difficulties because of the war. Then Daniel, Justin, Meg, and Natasha asked me this um, crazy question, which is, do you want to come to the United States to tell your story? And I said, of course I want to come to the United States, but how? So they told me, okay, we will try to do things for you. So Daniel, he reached AGC. And he asked AGC if they can give me an invitation to come to the United States. So I received an invitation from AGC from different, like eight, I think, eight, eight organizations. And all of them, they invite me to come to the United States. I went to the embassy, and I have with all these uh, invitations. And you need to, to know that when I arrived to Djibouti, I arrived from a war zone. I didn't buy any clothes. I had one dirty clothes with me. Uh, I had a big mustache. And I went to the embassy to apply for American visa to come to the United States. Um, they accept my visa. They gave me a visa. Daniel again, he posted on Facebook. And because his friend was watching the, new, watching the story on Facebook, one of his friends, he can go on. So an old college friend of mine, uh, way back when, it, when I, it took us two weeks to get him out of Yemen and six weeks, six weeks to get him through Djibouti. At the very beginning of this whole thing, I said, does anyone have any idea how to get a Yemeni out of Yemen? And an old college friend of mine, who's now a corporate bankruptcy attorney in Houston, said, uh, he said, I'll tell you what, if you get him out of Yemen, I'll buy him his ticket to the States. It's like, thanks, Chris. Like, you know, this guy's not going to make it out of Yemen. <laughs> so it felt like an empty, uh, empty promise. Uh, but eight weeks later, I called him up. I said, Chris, you're not going to believe it, but it's time for that ticket. Yeah. Chris said, when, where do you want him to fly? I said, tomorrow from Djibouti to San Francisco. So Chris decided, to, <laughs> he said, 
if anyone deserves to fly business class, it's this guy. So he, <laughs> and he had a ton of points. So he bought him a one-way business class, same-day ticket using points for a Yemeni applying, flying one way on a tourist visa. And, and you can imagine, like, someone with me with a big mustache with dirty clothes. I went to the Djibouti airport with a business class ticket with, with no luggage. And... <laughs> and he and, raised every red flag. <laughs> and I traveled to San Francisco. And the first day, like, Justin needed to pick me up. But because Justin had an emergency, he couldn't pick me up. So again, Justin, Daniel, posted on Facebook. He said, can anyone pick Mohammed from San Francisco Airport? <laughs> At that time, I didn't know how to use Uber or Lyft. We don't have these things in, in Yemen. <laughs> so a beautiful friend of him, her name Jenna, she shared his post on Facebook. A friend of her, he's a Chinese, he said, I will do it. He didn't have even a car. He rented a car, and he came to the airport, and he had this big sign that says, Mohammed Sanawi. And I just came from Djibouti, from the war zone. I don't know what's happening. I just saw him. I started to be emotional. So I came to him. I gave him the biggest hug, possible, and I said, thank you so much. I am safe now. And he looked at me and said, why? I said, I came from Yemen. He said, so? <laughs> Then I realized that he doesn't know anything about my story, but why did he come to pick me up? So I realized why, because when I was with him in the car, he asked me, so, Mohammed, from where do you know Jenna? I looked at him and said, who's Jenna? <laughs> and um, you can imagine how much fast he was driving. Um, and uh, maybe, like, I don't know, but maybe he has a crush on Jenna, and he thought that I would call Jenna and tell her, Jenna, he's an amazing human being, you should date him. <laughs> and when I, didn't, when I told him that I don't know Jenna, he started driving fast. And inside me, I was thinking, oh my god, I made it all the way from Yemen. Now I will die in San Francisco because it's a Chinese man. So I started trying to tell him the story as I tell you today. And he told me, wow, that's an amazing story. I would love to invite you for your first meal in the United States. Have you ever tried American food? I said, no. So he invited me for KFC. <laughs> And that was my first meal in the United States. <laughs> and that's the story of Foxant. Okay. <laughs>